Hello and welcome back guys to the Big Blue Purple channel. In this video I'd like to give a proper guide to Eureka in 2023. So if you're looking to get your relic armor or your relic weapon then you've come to the right place. Firstly if you haven't unlocked Eureka yet head to Ralgar's Reach and do the quest and we shall call it Eureka. It'll be a blue plus quest so it'll be easy to spot. Before you actually go into Eureka I have a few recommendations. First of all, I recommend getting either Cryptic Seals if you're a melee job, or Damascene Cloth if you're a caster job. These things will let you buy a armor piece from the Nostalgic Fellow in Pier 1, Kugane. These armor pieces will give you Elemental Bonus, which makes you significantly stronger within Eureka. Highly recommend getting these before you go in. It's not super expensive, and if you have the guilt to spare, it is 100% worth it. While you're at the market board, I also recommend picking up some Potions of Harmony. These give a 10% EXP buff within Eureka, and they're pretty cheap on the market board as well. If you've got your Alchemist leveled, you can actually craft these potions for yourself with materials from Pagos, but if not, just buy as many as you need. The last thing you'll need before you go into Eureka is your level 70 job weapon from the job quest. You'll need this to get the Eureka Relic, as that weapon will upgrade into the Relic. If you discarded your level 70 weapon, you can just go to any of the Calamity Salvagers around the three major city-states, and you can just buy it back. If you're interested in getting the dialable version of your level 70 job gear, you can also do that within Eureka, but you'll need to bring the original copies to Eureka. So if you're interested in the dialable job gear, make sure to bring the job gear as well. Once you're ready to go into Eureka, go speak to Rodney at Pier 1 in Kugane, and you'll be able to enter Animos. As soon as you get into Animos, remember to attune to the Aetherite at the start because it does not automatically attune you there. Every time you go to a new zone in Eureka, make sure you get that starting Aetherite, don't forget it. You'll notice you have a Magia board within Eureka, and what this does is introduce the elemental mechanics of Eureka. So enemies in Eureka will have certain elemental affinities, and you can use your Magia board to target that elemental affinity. You can give yourself an offensive or a defensive bonus depending on the situation. Most of the time, I recommend putting all your slots into the offensive bonus, and if you're a tank, maybe sometimes rotate that to the defensive bonus so you can tank more enemies. You'll get more pieces of Magicite as you progress through Eureka, and these will give you more Magia points on your Magia board. To get started in Animos, you want to rush to level 9, and your challenge log will be able to help you do that. Chaining mobs will also give you an EXP buff, so try to keep a chain going as much as you can. Most of the challenge logs are self-explanatory, just being kill certain elements of enemies, but two of them might be a little bit confusing if you're new to the zone. The Ashkin challenge refers to enemies that only spawn at nighttime, and the Sprite challenge refers to enemies that only spawn during specific weather conditions. You've probably seen sprites out in the open world, like lightning sprites and wind sprites and stuff. Within Eureka, they will only spawn under their weather conditions. So if it's raining, there'll be water sprites, if it's windy, there'll be wind sprites, etc. The challenge log will give absolutely massive EXP, and you can also refer to the map on EurekaTracker.com, very helpful website as you're progressing through Eureka. They have detailed maps on the website that will show you exactly where certain levels of enemies will spawn, so whatever level range you're at, you'll be able to find mobs around your level no problem if you use the map. I'll make sure to leave a link for the Eureka Tracker in the description so you can get to it easily. It's an insanely helpful website and I highly, highly recommend using it for all of your Eureka needs. Another way to get an EXP buff in Eureka is to look out for the elementals around the map. They're like these little fairies that you'll see, these colored fairies in each zone. If you go stand next to them, they'll give you a regen and an EXP boost that lasts for one hour. If you pay attention in chat, people will sometimes ping where these guys are at, so you can go easily find them. Someone will say elemental spotted at these coordinates. You can go there, and you can get yourself that nice EXP bonus. Once you reach level 9, go ahead and attune to the rest of the Aetherites in the zone, and you are now ready to join the NM train, or the Fate train, in Eureka. Fates are called Notorious Monsters in Eureka, and certain enemies need to be killed in order to spawn these Notorious Monsters. You'll see people in chat talking about prep for whatever the fate boss's name is, and what they're referring to is just killing the necessary enemies to spawn that given fate. Once again, Eureka Tracker will tell you what mobs you need to kill to spawn what NMs, but generally people in chat will also be really helpful, so if you're in a fate train group and you're not sure what you're supposed to be killing, feel free to ask. 
If you've never joined a Fate Train before and you're not sure what I'm talking about, all you need to do is go into Shout Chat and say that you're looking for a group for NMs or for Fates. Someone should invite you to their party and then you guys will just go around killing as many NMs as you can. The reason we actually party up for Fates in Eureka is so that everyone in the party gets a gold rating. This ensures that even if you're underleveled for the Fate, you'll still get tons of EXP from it and be able to level up quickly. The main reasons you want to start doing NMs once you reach level 9 is not only because it gives great experience, but also because you'll start getting Animos Crystals, and Animos Crystals are the currency you need to upgrade your Relic in Animos. An important thing to note about NMs or the Fates in Eureka is that people will designate a pull time in chat for what time they're going to pull the Fate at. This is to allow other players in the zone to get over to the Fate and get their rewards if they're not nearby. Pull times, at least on the Aether data center, are usually tied to Eorzea time, so make sure you set your clock to Eorzea time and then you'll know when to pull the enemies. Make sure to respect pull times, it'll help everyone out in the entire zone. Another important thing to mention about Eureka before we move on is that death in this zone results in de-leveling if you go ahead and respawn. So instead of respawning, make sure you always shout and chat for a res. To do this, you can use the POS command, which you'll see on screen now. Just type that in chat and say, hey, I need a res here, I died. And someone will always come over to you and give you a res, provided that there's other people in the instance. People are incredibly nice and helpful about this, so never be scared to ask for a res if you fuck up and die. It's way better to ask for a res than it is to D-level and have to grind all that back. Once you get some Animos crystals, you can actually go back to Geralt in the main hub of Animos and turn them in for Protean crystals. Protean crystals are the currency you actually need to upgrade the weapon, and you'll need 1300 of these. The good news is, Animos crystals turn into more than one Protean crystal per turn in. I don't know the exact number, but it's anywhere between like 5 and 10 Protean crystals per Animos crystal. If this sounds a bit confusing to you, don't worry about it, because this is the only zone you'll ever need to turn in your crystals to other crystals. For the last step of your Animos relic, you'll need three Pazuzu feathers. These can be obtained in two different ways. First of all, you can do the Pazuzu Fate if you're level 19 or higher and you see it spawn. This will give you Pazuzu Feathers. Or you can trade Protean Crystals in for Pazuzu Feathers at the Expedition Birdwatcher in the main hub area. You'll need an extra 900 Protean Crystals if you decide to buy all the Pazuzu Feathers, so keep that in mind. The only other thing you'll need to keep track of while you're in Animos is your actual main Eureka quest. You'll notice when you're going through the main Eureka quest, it doesn't have markers for where you're supposed to go next. There's plenty of helpful maps online to see where all the quests are going to be, I'll put some on screen now, but I'm not going to explain each individual quest location in this video, because that would take far too long. I think the only thing I haven't mentioned about Animos so far would be the lockboxes. You'll notice that you get some Animos lockboxes by doing the NMs and the Fates in the zone. You can go turn these in in the main hub to the lock picker, and you'll be able to get some nice glam and potentially a mount if you're lucky. Usually though, you just get some fireworks and some trash materia. Short summary of Animos though, rush to level 9 using the challenge log, attune to all the etherites, join the NM train once you have all the etherites so you can navigate the map, and then just spam NMs until you have all your crystals and you reach max level for Animos, which is level 20. Once you finish up your relic weapon, reach level 20, and complete all the Eureka quests in the zone, you'll be ready to move on to Pagos, the worst and most tedious Eureka zone. Now, I know I just said you needed to be level 20 to enter Pagos, but I recommend you get a little more levels in Animos before going to Pagos. The enemies in Pagos are far more brutal than Animos, and they aggro a lot easier, so you'll be in a lot more danger if you come here just at level 20. Once you're around 21 or 22 or so, though, you can start chaining mobs in Pagos and getting to level 25 as fast as you can. If you have any of your challenge log left from Animos, then be sure to do that here, because Pagos is 100% the worst zone, and using your challenge log here is definitely the best use of your time. Another key thing worth mentioning that's new in Pagos would be mutations. Certain enemies are actually able to mutate under certain conditions, and that'll increase their EXP yield, and it'll also give you a chance to receive a cold warped lockbox, which is like the rarer lockbox in this zone. Mutated mobs are very dangerous, so do not fight them in packs, but if you can find mobs, single them out and let them mutate, that'll definitely be a great source of EXP, especially if you can chain them. Something you'll also immediately notice in Pagos is that there are two fates that are essentially permanently up. These are the bunny fates, and upon completion, will send you on basically a little treasure hunt. 
The treasure in Pagos is not super important, but there's a couple of big deal items you could get lucky and obtain. I don't recommend farming the Pagos lockboxes for gill because Pyros is a much more consistent source of gill, but if you're interested in it then feel free to do the bunny fates all you want. They're a decent source of EXP at low level, but they're pretty negligible at high levels. If you do plan on running the bunny fates in this zone, I highly highly recommend the lower level one because it gives the exact same rewards but it's in a much safer area. You won't be navigating past any like level 35 mobs. Once you reach level 25 and progress the Eureka quest accordingly, you'll acquire the Kettle from Geralt. This will be highly important for the Relic. The Kettle will allow you to collect Frosted Protean Crystals, and these are necessary to upgrade the Relic within Pagos. You want to rush level 25 here as fast as you can, so you can get this Kettle as fast as you can. It essentially fills up with light the more enemies you kill and the more fates you do, and you'll be able to turn in this light later to get the Frosted Protean Crystals. You want to get to level 25 and get the kettle as fast as possible, so you're not wasting any of that light. Once level 25, you'll also be able to get all the etherites in the zone. The first one is available at 21, the second one is available at level 23, and then the third one is available at level 25. So you can go ahead and get the other ones as soon as you want, and then just get the last one at 25, and you'll be all good to navigate the fate train. Now, you'll realize very quickly if you join the fate train that navigating this zone can be a complete pain in the ass. There's a lot of cliffs and ledges that you need to drop off on to reach certain caves that have a fate inside of them, and it's a lot to learn when you're new to the zone. My best advice to you is to just get into a fate group and just follow the people who know what they're doing, and then you'll be able to learn all the locations for the fates very quickly. There is one very important cliff we're going to talk about right now though. To turn your actual light from the kettle into protean crystals, you need to reach the crystal forge. And of course, this Crystal Forge is not placed in a convenient location at all. To get there, you're going to want to go to the level 23 Aetherites and drop off the cliff you'll be seeing on screen now. You'll also notice that there's a Sleeping Dragon here. To get past the Sleeping Dragons in the zone, which you may have encountered before, you need to slow walk. You need to know what your walk key is going to be, and you're going to have to press that and slow walk past them to not aggro them. If you aggro these guys, you are 100% dead, so don't even try it. Make sure you know what your walk key is and always walk past these guys. These sleeping dragons are absolutely littered throughout the zone, so keep your eyes peeled and try not to get absolutely destroyed by these guys. Now, there's a couple of key NMs in Pagos that are actually worth talking about here. The most notable are Cassie and Crab. These two are NMs that'll spawn and have special drops that only they can drop. Cassie drops the Cassie Earring, and the Crab drops the Blitz Ring. These two items both give some stat bonuses in Eureka, but they also sell for a ton of gil on the market board. These items are not at all necessary to make it through Eureka, complete it, or even do the Baldessian Arsenal, so don't worry about them too much unless you want to make some gil. The important thing to note about these two fates is that, at least on my data center, they get insta-pulled regularly, so you need to be there as soon as people are prepping it so you don't miss the drop. One other fate I think is worth talking about is the Haku Taku fate. You'll notice when you do this, you only get a silver rating, regardless of how well you do in it. This is because you need the Haku Taku Eye Cluster in your inventory to actually get gold. To make the Haku Taku Eye Cluster, you need to craft it, and it requires five different Haku Taku items from the lockboxes and the bunny fates in this zone. It can also be purchased on the market board for a ridiculous amount of gil, we're talking like 5 million. If you actually have the eye cluster and you get the gold rating, you have a chance to receive the optical hat item. This gives you a haste bonus, but it overall is not essential to progress into Eureka once again. It's just extra stuff to do if you want to stay in Pagos any longer for whatever reason. If you're only interested in getting the armor, the weapon, and the Ozma mount, then do not worry about this. This is extra stuff for the Eureka players. The last two fates in the zone I think are worth talking about are the Brothers Fate and the Louis Fate. The important thing to note about these is that you'll have to drop off a cliff to reach them, similar to the forge we talked about earlier. You shouldn't have too much trouble finding the right cliff if you're following the fate train, but I'll put a picture up on screen now to see which cliffs you need to drop off of. An important thing to note about the Brothers Fate is that they can actually mutate each other. The fate is like two bosses and they can mutate each other with a cast, but this cast is interjectable. 
If you want to get the most crystal yield or the vitalated ether yield for your crystals, then you're going to want to let them mutate. This means you'll get way more light for the kettle and in turn be able to get way more crystals. The mutated version of this boss isn't much harder anyways, and if there's enough people in the zone, it really doesn't matter. So always let these guys mutate for the sake of crystals. The Louis Fate, or the Luigi Fate, as the community has dubbed it, will drop Louis Ice, which you need to upgrade your relic weapon. It's similar to the Pazuzu Feathers from the last zone. You'll need to be within one level of the Fate to receive the drop, so that means you'll need to be level 34 in this zone to start getting Louis Ice. If you don't get enough Louis Ice from the Fate, you can always buy it from the Bird Watcher yet again for 50 Pagos Crystals each. Otherwise, to complete the relic, you're just going to need a total of 500 Pagos Crystals, and then you'll need 21 of those Frosted Protean Crystals. Remember, those are from the Kettle that you need to go all the way down to the Crystal Forge and turn in your light. Now, an important thing to note about the Kettle that I forgot to mention before is that it is capped at 9 Crystals. So if you have 9 Crystals in your Kettle, go turn that in or you are going to be wasting the Aether Yield. Pagos is a rough area to get through, it's annoying to navigate, the sleeping dragons are annoying, and leveling feels like it takes forever, but if you can get through it, I assure you, Pyros is far less frustrating and far more interesting. Once you've reached level 35, completed all the Eureka quests in the zone, and gotten your relic weapon, you'll be ready to move on to Pyros. Pyros will raise your level cap to 50, the Aetherites will become available at levels 37, 39, and 41. After you do the first couple starter quests in the zone, you'll be introduced to Logos actions. Logos actions are special Eureka specific actions and they give different effects to you depending on the Logos. To actually make Logos actions, you'll need to get Logo Grams. To get these, do pretty much anything in the zone, kill mobs, do fates, and you'll get plenty of Logo Grams. You'll be able to mix and match all sorts of logograms to make different logos actions, and Eureka Tracker has a super helpful tool for seeing all the different recipes you'll need to use. All of the logos actions are cool and interesting, and I recommend experimenting with them, but the most important one we want to talk about in this video is Reflect. Reflect is important because it allows you to do Reflect Farming, which speeds up leveling in this zone dramatically. Reflect will do, well, exactly what it says. It'll reflect damage back towards enemies, specifically magic damage. This is really useful because you can go to elemental sprites that are, say, 5 to 7 levels higher than you, and just pop Reflect and watch them kill themselves. Don't bother with enemies that are 8 levels or more higher than you because the XP yield is greatly reduced, like significantly reduced, so don't even bother. I recommend looking for elemental sprites higher level than you, um, depending on what weather condition it is, to rush to level 40 or 41. From here, your leveling is going to go insanely fast. Once you're around level 40 or 41, you can go to the Carbonatite Quarry Aetherite, and there's going to be these white flames here. You'll be able to farm these guys incredibly efficiently because there's like 50 of them in one spot. You just pop Reflect and run around in circles, recasting Reflect over and over again and you will level up from level 40 to level 48 insanely quickly. Once you're between 46 to 48, feel free to go join the NM train and start farming your Pyros Crystals. This time you'll need 650 Pyros Crystals, and you'll need 5 Penthesilia Flames. These are from the Penthesilia Fate boss, which you can only get rewards from at level 49 or higher. This time around, you won't have to worry about any Frosted Protean Crystals or Kettle nonsense, but you will need to get at least 30 Logos actions discovered to complete the Relic in this zone, the Pyros weapon. Now beyond that, if you'd like to get the Glowy Armor set, you'll first need to get the non-Glowy Armor set in Pyros. But to get the armor, you actually need to discover all 50 Logos actions in the zone. My recommendation to you is to not bother farming these out, once you feel like you've gotten through most of the zone and you have all your crystals, see how many Logos actions you can get on your own, and then just buy the rest on the market board, because they're not very expensive and it'll speed up your progression so, so much. Once you've got all your Logos actions, you'll be able to speak with the Expedition Artisan now and create the armor pieces. For these, you'll need 40 Pyros Crystals each, which will be a total of 200 Pyros Crystals if you want the whole set. This means if you want both the weapon and the armor set, you're going to need 850 crystals, so it can feel like a pretty long grind in Pyros, but thankfully leveling up is really quick thanks to Reflect Farming, and you can just get straight into farming all the fates at their appropriate levels. 
I should also mention that even if you only want the armor and don't care about the weapon, you'll still have to do the weapon up to Pyro so that you can get the armor set. Now you'll notice that there is a kettle once you've completed your Pyro's weapon similar to the one in Pagos. This is only to alter the stats on your weapon, and you can completely ignore it if you only care about the glam. The stats obviously don't matter nowadays. The bunny fates from Pagos are also present in Pyros once again, but they're far more worth your time here. If you get a gold chest, it's an instant guaranteed 100,000 gil. Just in the chest. On top of this, you can get several items that sell for a big gil on the market board, and you can also get a mount. Now, similar to Pagos, there's a few fates in this zone that have valuable drops. These are related to the 6th Magicite that you can actually get for your Magia board. You can get a 6th one if you get all 3 drops from these 3 fates, but they're very rare and overall it's not very important. Lamebricks, Skull, and Ying Yang are the 3 bosses, and they get instable regularly on my data center, so be there early if you want the rewards. The 3 drops from these NMs sell for a lot of gil on the market board, which is the primary reason you'll see them get instapulled. Otherwise, the 6th Magicite really only matters if you're like hardcore into Eureka and you're planning to do tons of relics and just spend tons of time in the zone. Most of your time in this zone will definitely be spent farming crystals, but once you've gotten your 850 crystals and you complete your weapon and armor, you'll be ready to move on to the final zone, Hydatos. Hydatos is the final stretch of Eureka, but it's a very long final stretch given how low the crystal yield is this time around. The level cap is raised to 60 here, and this will be your max level within Eureka. Six new Logos actions will also become available once you reach Hydatos. You'll need to get these six new Logos actions if you'd like to get the glowy armor. When you actually get to Hydatos, there's a pretty good chance you'll be a little bit leveled up already from all the Pyros grinding. I recommend just hopping right into the Fate Train because you're going to need a ton of crystals, and it's best to just start earning them as fast as possible. Hydatos is also a completely flat map, so it's way easier to navigate than any of the other zones, and even if you don't have all the Aetherites immediately, you'll still have a good chance to make it to every single fate on time. If you do want to rush levels for whatever reason, Reflect Farming is still extremely potent here, so feel free to Reflect Farm your way all the way to 60 if that's what you want to do. Being level 59 can definitely help get you some crystals because of the Avni fate. It's a level 60 NM that spawns every half hour or so, and it's extremely consistent because it gives 10 crystals per kill. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but in the context of Hydatos, that's actually the most crystals you'll see from a single NM. To finish off your weapon, you're going to need 350 crystals, and if you want to get the armor, you're going to need an extra 190 crystals for the full set. The most crystals you'll see drop from a single fate is 10. There is actually one exception to this being the Baldessian Arsenal support fate, but this spawns so rarely because people have to be doing BA for it to actually spawn. And it's a support fate that will spawn on the map, you do it and it gives you a whopping 30 crystals. The reason it gives you 30 crystals though is because Avni is not going to spawn for 2 hours. When you go into BA it stops Avni from spawning because he's tied to getting into BA. Apart from the crystals, this time around you'll have to get Crystalline Scales, which will drop from the Provenance Watcher fate. Unlike the last zones, you won't actually be able to buy these with Hydatos crystals, but you'll definitely not need to do that anyway, because Provenance Watcher will spawn way more than you get crystals in this zone. The Bunny Fates also spawn in this zone again, there's only one this time. The most notable thing you can get from them in this zone is an item that will increase the amount of Logos actions you can carry at a time. This can be really helpful for certain things in BA or whatnot, but it's not necessary and you can definitely get through all the content without it, but if you're interested in grinding out more Logos actions, it's an option. There's also three Fade bosses in this zone, similar to the ones in Pyros that drop items for a seventh Magicite. These are Malek, Seto, and King Goldmar. Once again, these have high risk of being instant pulled, especially on the Aether data center, so make sure you're there as soon as they are up. Once again, these items sell for a lot on the market board, and the 7th Magicite itself is highly unnecessary for any kind of Eureka progress, so if you get them, it's probably worth just putting it up for sale. You'll probably spend the most time in Hydatos out of any single zone for the sheer amount of crystals you need and how little it gives you per NM. Once you reach max level in the zone and you complete the main Eureka quest, 
you'll unlock access to the Baldessian Arsenal. You don't need to complete the relic to actually enter BA, so feel free to enter it whenever you feel like it. I did BA before I finished my raid. This guide will not teach you the mechanics in the raid or explain the raid, but I'm going to go over a few prerequisites before you decide to go in. First and foremost, make sure to join the BA Discord server for your respective data center. A quick Google search should be able to find it for you. All BA runs nowadays are organized within these Discord servers, so it's pretty much going to be impossible for you to do the content unless you join one. The people are extremely helpful in these discords, and their callouts will make it so you clear pretty much no problem without the need for any guides. Before you actually enter BA, make sure you bring some specific Logos actions. Most importantly, Spirit of the Remembered. This Logos action gives you a 70% chance of being revived when you die, and will effectively be the only way to get rezzed within BA. Spirit of the Remembered also functions differently than other Logos actions because you can switch Logos boards after you use it and the buff will still stay active on your character. This means when you go into BA, you can pop Spirit of the Remembered and then change to a Logos board with better offensive actions if you're a DPS or better support actions, etc. Now, once you actually get your Logos actions ready and you've signed up for a BA run, how do you get into BA? First, you'll have to do the Avni Fate. By killing Avni, you'll actually get a buff that lets you see portals. These portals are what's going to let you enter BA. In your run, it's likely that you'll be assigned a specific portal somewhere on the map, and you'll just go to that portal when you need to enter. If you are in a full BA run or near full BA run, do not enter the blue portals for BA. They'll, the portals will first be blue, but then they'll turn red in a couple minutes, and that'll make your entry free. Otherwise, if you want to enter the blue portal, you need a specific item. The reason you actually don't want to enter the blue portals and wait for the red ones is because if you take a blue portal, it'll actually make another red portal disappear somewhere on the map. If you're in a full BA run, everyone has to go through the red portals, otherwise people aren't going to be able to get in. Otherwise, just listen to your callers and enjoy the raid. It's a really good time and it's probably my favorite part of Eureka. The only other thing to note about the Relic weapon and BA is that if you want to get the truly complete Relic with the Elemental bonus, you actually have to do BA to farm out the Eureka Fragments. That's how you get your Physios weapon. If all you care about is the glamour and the appearance of the weapon, the Eureka weapon that you just get from the Hydatos Crystals looks identical from the fully upgraded one. So if you're not interested in doing BA but you want the weapon, do not worry about it. The completed relic only has elemental bonus and looks effectively the same as the second to last step. The Eureka Fragments can also be used to upgrade your elemental armor to plus two. The plus one version is already diable, so again, the only reason you would do this is for more elemental bonus if you're interested in doing a ton more Eureka content and you want to get stronger. All in all though, that should be everything you need to know to get into Eureka in 2023. Eureka can seem incredibly daunting when you're new to it because it is the longest relic grind in this game, but the actual process of going through the zones is a lot simpler than it may seem from the outside looking in. The core of your gameplay loop really just breaks down into doing NMs over and over again to get crystals and level up as fast as possible. Otherwise, just enjoy yourself. Eureka can be a really fun community-oriented experience within Final Fantasy, and I think a lot of people might enjoy it more than they might initially think. I hope this video was helpful to you if you're planning to get into Eureka in 2023. And if you're a Eureka veteran who happened to stumble upon this video, feel free to add anything in the comments below that you feel like I missed. This is kind of the first long form guide content I've ever tried to make. So if I miss some things, please, please feel free to correct me or add things in the comments below. If you're interested in hearing more about Eureka, I have another video on my channel called the Eureka Experience 2023 where I talk about my own personal experience going through Eureka and what it was like start to finish. If you want a little bit of extra information to supplement this guide, then I recommend checking that out. Remember to leave a like on the video, but only if you found it helpful, and subscribe to the Big Blue Purple channel if you're not already. I talk about Final Fantasy all the time on this channel. Now go grind yourself a nice shiny Eureka weapon.